this is a good segue, I think, to um, introducing Jose Francisco Salgado, who um, I'm really excited is speaking to us today. And you can tell that our community uh, appreciates both the science and the beauty. Um, one of the folks actually, a photographer from Calgary, Neil Zeller, just took some uh, awesome pictures of the substructures of Steve. And he took a one second time lapse uh, for five minutes, I think, over this past weekend also, which was really, really cool and, and going to look cool. But he said he sacrificed the beauty for that one. So <laughs> I thought that was a funny comment that um, I, I appreciate uh, the, the sacrifice of the beauty, but the beauty in it in and of itself is also really important. So um, Laura, would you like to um, introduce Jose Francisco? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I am delighted to have with us today, Dr. Jose Francisco Salgado, an Emmy nominated astronomer, experimental photographer, visual artist and public speaker who creates multimedia works that communicate science in engaging ways. As the executive director and co-founder of KV265, a nonprofit science and art uh, at education organization, Dr. Salgado collaborates with orchestras, composers, and musicians to present films that provoke curiosity and a sense of wonder about the earth and the universe. And we are also joined today by his daughter, Estrella. So thank you all so much for being here. Um, did I miss anything, Dr. Salgado? No, that was, thank you so all much right, uh, sure. for that uh, introduction. And I'm delighted to be chatting with you all uh, today. So thank you so much for the invitation. Oh, our pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, so let's see. It's uh, then share the uh, presentation. Uh, let's see. Looking good over there? Looking great. Thank you. Oh, okay, great. So, um, so today I'll basically tell you um, uh, why I, you know, uh, photograph the Northern Lights, how I use the, the footage of the Northern Lights. My uh, background is in astronomy, but actually it's in, in my research background uh, is in radio astronomy and, you know, faraway galaxies and the interstellar medium, not with uh, the Northern Lights, but after grad school, I um, was, my, my career uh, uh, turned into, instead of research, into science communication, education, public outreach. So I started working at the Adler Planetarium in, uh, in Chicago, and that led to all these projects combining science and art and, 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 and music. And then one of the subjects we started to explore was the Northern Lights because they're so awe-inspiring. What we want is things that are extremely visually appealing to get people's attention and then communicate science. And luckily in astronomy, that's very easy to do, right? Because astronomical images are so beautiful that it's to, so easy to get, um, to get people's uh, attention. Um, so now I lead an organization called KV265, a nonprofit organization. So I work for, for that organization full time. And, um, and I'm also leading Aurora tours again, because of, you know, as a result of my involvement with Aurora photography and my, and my, in my interest in the, uh, in the subject. So uh, with KV265, what we do is we use the visual arts and music as a vehicle to communicate science. That is as a way to engaging people, getting people's attention, and then actually tell them uh, a little bit about science, about the universe, and more than, than lecturing them ab about it, is what we want to do is inspire people to learn more about what they see on screen in the presentations on their own. Uh, having said that, I give possibly about 12 lectures during the year uh, using these films. So the main way through which we communicate science uh, is through a, a series of films called Science and Symphony Films that are edited to accompany performances of orchestral works, be it of you know, classical works, uh, as well as um, uh, modern pieces and, 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 and music that we commission for these, uh, for these films. So here you have an example in Millennium Park in Chicago. That's the premiere of our first uh, film based on the Northern Lights. And uh, so you see the orchestra, 
the, um, the screen above. And in this case, we got 17 and 15,000 people uh, in Millennium Park free concert watching, not only listening to the beautiful music, but watching the beautiful images of, of the Northern Lights. So this project started in two, 2006 and uh, we're on like 12th production, 235 concerts and, and, and we have reached uh, about 460,000 people. And when I say reach, not talking about YouTube likes or you know vi or views or or likes or faves. I'm talking about people in the hall or in in this case, you know, in the park, uh, being inspired by by science. So it all started with that uh, film. I um, I just show you about that a premiere uh, called The Legend of the Northern Lights, uh, with music originally composed for the work by. Chris Theophanidis, uh, American composer. And the success of that project and the fact that I fell in love with Aurora photography, I had seen the lights from uh, Rochester, New York in the late eighties. Um, but then starting to do this, uh, once I started to do this professionally capturing the photography for the films, I you know, fell in love with, with, uh, with a phenomenon and then that led to a second work, Aurora Triptych, uh, with music by Canadian composer John Estacio, who had already composed this music inspired by the, by the Northern Lights, and uh, to a commission uh, by Boston Pops for a Christmas concert using, you know, our footage of, of the Northern Lights. So once I started, uh, once we decided that we wanted to go in this direction and, and, and get the footage for, for the first production, um, I started visiting different places where I knew that the lights were, you know, were visible, including Anchorage, because we were working with Anchorage Symphony. So every time I would go and present one of the films, I would try to capture uh, the, uh, the lights from from, from Anchorage. Uh, Aurora Borealis is a term that we think was coined by, by Galileo in, in, in 16 by, uh, 1619. And um, it's basically a combination of, you know, the names of the Roman goddess of, of the dawn, Aurora, and the Greek name uh, for, the, uh, for the north wind. Uh, other places from where I have photographed the Northern Lights include, you know, Furbanks, as you know, they have, you know, Poker Flat uh, a research range. So I have been in, in Furbanks actually twice. Uh, I presented one of the films with the symphony in Furbanks, so that it was very neat to actually present in a city where the Northern Lights is so play such a big role in their in their daily lives and in tourism and so on and that is the case of Fairbanks as well as of uh, of uh, Anchorage. Uh, Iceland uh, in Iceland I spent a week in um, in the summer of a few years ago I saw them only once because the conditions are very very cloudy and then I returned um, this was actually early spring, and then it went in the summer, and it was a similar uh, situation. The challenge of, of Iceland is that when you are surrounded by water, you're going to have a lot of, you know, cloud formation, you know, competing with the fact that you want to see the lights. So I always tell people, go to I Iceland because of the beautiful landscapes, and then if you see the northern lights, that's a, that's a big bonus. And, uh, and then, of course, I, I've seen them from, uh, from flights. Um, uh, flying back from Anchorage to uh, to O'Hare, I have seen them a couple of times. So, um, uh, by the way, unless in unless indicated, uh, most of the photo photography is actual uh, actually based on, on on photographs that I have taken from uh, from around the world, and that's part also of the mission using photography as a way to communicate science. But we'll see examples of other other photographers like this one, for example. I've been at the South Pole Station, but during the, during the spring in the South, meaning that I didn't get to see the night sky for nine days. Um, but so when you, if you go at night, then you have to commit to at least eight, eight months of your life because flights don't travel uh, to and from 
uh, the South Pole during the winter months. So here's a beautiful example of the Northern Lights above the, uh, the South Pole Station. And then of course, from the International Space Station. So some of my uh, films include my photography from the ground as well as time-lapse photography shot by astronauts aboard the, uh, the ISS. Okay. And of course we see uh, Northern Lights or I should say auroras because of course we have Northern and Southern Lights um, in, uh, in, other, uh, in other planets, we, or other bodies in the case of Io, which is a moon. So we need two key ingredients. We need an atmosphere that will glow and we need a magnetic field that will impart the necessary energy to those particles coming from the sun to be accelerated in such a way that they can produce the, uh, the northern, the, the auroras as we see them. Uh, Venus, for example, has a, some glow um, because particles are coming, are, being, are buffeting the, uh, the uh, atmosphere continuously but there is no magnetic field uh, guiding those particles and accelerating them to the speeds necessary to see, to, to see what we witness here on, on Earth. So yes, it, the atmosphere does glow, but it's not the structures that we see um, in the arrest that, that we can admire here on Earth. Uh, so the gas giants produce uh, uh, auroras and, and they have been captured on, on Io as well. And then I'll focus during this presentation, I'll focus, uh, 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 in, focus on Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories of Canada, because that's where I go to do the, uh, the photography and to lead, uh, to lead tours. So, um, there are people say, you know, the Northern Lights uh, are, are, you know, are produced uh, by particles, high energy particles coming from the sun, which is true, but it's more complicated than that, right? They're, they don't come necessarily directly from the sun and then they buffet the earth atmosphere, but there's a little bit of, uh, uh, it's a more complicated story, including our magnetic field. But nevertheless, most of these particles that produce the Northern Lights come from, from the sun, which is the sun is, um, is composed of plasma, that is gas that it's so hot that many electrons have been stripped from their um, from their nuclei, from their you know from their atoms. So you get a soup of positively charged nuclei and uh, negatively charged electrons. So globally, the gas is neutral, but within you have uh, electric currents, and um, and electric currents are always associated with magnetic fields and vice versa. So the sun is a very, very uh, complex system uh, composed of you know, magnetic fields and, and very, very hot uh, plasma. So those particles reach the earth and you know, there are three you know, general mechanisms, uh, mechanisms through which they, they reach us. There's this continuous solar wind, right? That never, never ceases. It's, you know, uh, um, it's uh, the, the speed is not as, high as in these uh, you know, explosions we, we call coronal mass ejections and flares and so on, but nevertheless, it's, it's continuous. So we're continuously being buffeted by these particles. Now, when uh, some of these magnetic fields break in, uh, in the sun, then there's a sudden release of, of particles and we call those uh, coronal mass ejections. Also, when the magnetic field opens up and uh, to the point that, that they, uh, you know, th there's a, a loop that closes very, very far away from the sun. It forms like a, like, a, like a super highway where particles can escape at really, really high speeds and reach very uh, large distances. So we call those coronal holes. So of course, all of those things will impact, will produce a space weather that will impact what happens in the atmosphere of of our planet. Um, so, and we can say that we are embedded in the space weather created by, by the sun. So this is one of the films and you can hear a little bit of music in the background. Dr. Salgado, would you mind uh, resharing uh, re your screen and hitting uh, share audio, can you do? Okay, let's see, it says your 
screen sharing. So go on ahead and toggle that again to say uh, turn off screen sharing, the green button okay. at the bottom. Okay, very well. So. And try it again. And when you do, uh, hit share sound for me. Okay. Thank you. Okay, very well. So let me go. Ah, okay. So I see it doesn't, so it doesn't uh, remember the settings. Okay. For so, sure. Okay, very well. So share sound. You getting sound now? Okay, so that's actual footage uh, from the SDO uh, spacecraft. And this is part of that Aurora triptych uh, film. So what you see here, I always love to talk about prominences with, when talking about the Northern Lights, because these prominences, these loops, are basically the, um, the, uh, the magnetic field of the sun, which is rendered visible by the, by the glowing plasma. So if you remove the plasma, the, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the field would be rendered invisible. So in a very, very similar way, when we're seeing the Northern Lights on Earth, we're, we're seeing the magnetic field of the Earth rendered visible by that glowing gas. So it's a beautiful connection between what's invisible and what is not. So here's a, a diagram of the magnetic field of the Earth. Most of the particles coming from the sun get deflected. So we don't get to see, um, uh, so those particles actually don't penetrate the, uh, the magnetic field, but some of them do. And when they do, they are collected in the tail of the magnetic field. And when those particles get accelerated, uh, they, become uh, that part of the, uh, the aurora, the, uh, the magnetic tail becomes unstable and it snaps like a rubber band and then accelerates those particles. When those particles reach the, um, the Earth's atmosphere, that's when we'll get to see the Northern Lights. And here's a, an example of one of the films. So that's, that's a visualization from NASA Goddard. And then as you can see, as the uh, magnetic field goes through the atmosphere and those particles are guided by the magnetic fields, they will interact with gases in the atmosphere, make them glow. And that's when we see uh, the auroras. So we'll have an aurora oval center on the geomagnetic pole, not the geographic pole, but on the geomagnetic pole of the earth from where uh, from where you can see the uh, the auroras. Okay, so the auroras are basically natural uh, gas discharge tubes. I mean, it's basically the same principle. What we call, you know, colloquially neon lights is basically a, a tube with a gas at a very low pressure. So you have few particles per, you know, cubic uh, centimeter. And then you pass a current, an electric current from one end to the other. And when they collide, when those particles collide with the atoms or molecules in the gas, the bound electrons are going to go to higher energy levels. You know, so they are, by collision, they get excited, they go to higher energy levels. And when they come down, they will release that energy in the form of light. So depending on which gas you put inside the tube, you'll get different colors. Because just like, you know, fingerprints, each atom has a particular atomic structure, meaning different energy levels and different energy levels and different differences between the energy levels will correspond to different energies and different colors. So what they do, the manufacturers, manufacturers of these nine, uh, uh, neon signs, they combine different gases in different proportions to obtain the different colors. Okay? So here we have, you can see all those lines uh, that's the magnetic field of the magnetic field lines of the uh, of the field, the magnetic field of the Earth being rendered visible by uh, by the auroras. 
and, and you can see the, the different uh, lines in this photograph, okay? The, li the, li the light is not produced continuously, but it will happen at discrete energies or discrete colors because what I was mentioning about each atom or molecule having a particular uh, atomic structure. Okay, so nitrogen will glow uh, purple and blue and green and oxygen will glow red and green. So um, this is a, a diagram showing you that you have the incoming electron collides with, uh, with, with the atom or molecule. A bound electron goes to a higher energy level, will sp spend some finite amount of time. And when it comes down, it will release that energy in the form of a photon. Okay? So you have oxygen uh, happening about 150 kilometers up. Uh, the radiative uh, uh, lifetime, that is how long will it stay up there before it comes down is about one second. So if the air is too dense, I mean, one second, it is a long time in the sense that before it comes down on its own, it could be forced down by another collision. So when the gas is too dense, that is too close to the, to the Earth's uh, surface, we don't get auroras because before that, those electrons can come down on their own and emit light, they are forced down by, by collisions. And that's why auroras, for them to happen, the air cannot be very, very uh, uh, dense. So in the case of the red light, it occurs at 150 kilometers up. Now, in the case of, um, in the case of, let me take, uh, move this a little bit here. Okay, so yeah, okay. So now I'm getting the right number. So oxygen is 1.8 minutes, uh, the, the red light. Okay, so that is a really long time. Now, uh, the, okay, now green, we go back. Okay, now green is the one that it's, you know, uh, uh, that has a radiative lifetime of, of one second. Um, so then um, that's why you have the difference between, you know, the, the height and, um, and the color. So, Depending on the radiative lifetime, you'll get one color or the other, depending on if we're giving a chance for that electron to come down on its own. So, and as you can see, some green light dominates uh, so much that you get uh, reflection of the, you can get reflection even off the ground. And then of course, in the winter of the snow. And, uh, Again, here you see the uh, you see the uh, the gradient of uh, green. There is a cutoff because the air is too dense, and then above the the green, you get uh, red light is what what dominates. And again, and here you see the same colors, and then you see uh, additional information uh, uh, the heights. And uh, what's called a mean free path, meaning at very low altitude and low, of course, relatively speaking, it's still you know, 62 miles. The mean free path is one meter. That means that an electron can actually travel one meter before encountering another uh, particle. But at 124 miles up or 200 kilometers, it, the mean free path is actually in the order of kilometers. So it can travel longer, longer distances be, before encountering another uh, particle and, and colliding with it. Um, so, uh, so as you can see, it's very, uh, uh, the, the, the density is very, very high at, at, those, uh, at those altitudes. Uh, we get uh, nitrogen, uh, nitrogen light, red light or, or magenta, that happens at the lower edge of the curtain that is at below the green. And that, the significance of that one to the viewer and the photographer is that it's picked up by the human eye very, very, uh, very easily because it's so bright. Uh, and that happens during, uh, during substorms. So we'll talk about substorms in a, in, a, in a couple of minutes. So you see the, 
So you see the magenta, the green, and then above the green, you can have the, uh, the, the, uh, the red from, from oxygen. And then during twilight, we get a blue purple light. And what's happening here is that the aurora is actually, those gases are interacting with sunlight. So for us at this particular time, the sun has already set, but at that altitude, the aurora is seeing sunlight. So you have an additional uh, physical process uh, with the interaction of, of sunlight. And, and then of course, it, it will be visible on, on, only during twilight because if you wait longer then the sun will be, uh, will set even for that uh, altitude. And, uh, and then the combination of these uh, main colors produce other, other colors. Uh, for example, when you combine uh, red and blue emission, you get a, a pinkish color. Uh, when you combine red and green, you get yellow. So pink and yellow are not spectral lines corresponding to a particular uh, transition, but it's actually that along that line of sight, you are seeing more than, uh, more than one color. And then I love how in a single photograph, you can actually share so much science. You can talk about the processes uh, happening, look at all the colors in this photograph, but also other objects that you can see at, at, at that latitude and of course away from city light. So you can see some uh, clusters and you know, the Andromeda galaxy, the outskirts of the Milky Way. So um, if you want to see uh, this photography and actually learn about uh, how to, uh, the equipment that you need and some techniques, I have an article on DP Review. If you put in my, my name, um, you'll see how to photograph the Northern Lights and also some, I review some equipment. So for example, a good lens to use for this kind of photography is uh, a Sigma 14 millimeter lens. And I have an article where I did some astrophotography with it. And then on Flickr, if you go to my Northern Lights or uh, Aurora album, you can see many of these um, examples. Okay, so in terms of structures, you can view and, and photograph homogeneous arcs. Uh, again, you see the curtains of light, but you don't see the particular, you know, the individual race as you can see here. Okay, and of course, the uh, they're relatively thin compared to their height. Uh, so the Average thickness of these curtains of lights are about 230 uh, meters. But as you can see, the vertical uh, uh, scale is, uh, is, is humongous. Uh, what they call the aurora, it's basically when you're seeing the, uh, the, the curtains of light from below. And then of course, just like uh, uh, tr uh, train tracks, you see them converging uh, in the distance. So here you're, kind of like in the middle of two of these uh, curtains of light looking straight up, looking towards uh, the zenith. And then you see folds. Remember that the magnetic field in the atmosphere is uh, continuously interacting with the particles and the solar wind and the particles coming from uh, the magnetic tail. So this, the, these light structures will continuously change during the night. So sometimes we have folds, and multiple folds, kinks, which the time scale is very, very, very short. So in time-lapse sequences with very long duration, you can see them just, you know, zapping uh, through. Uh, so they occur at very, very high uh, speeds. They propagate at very high speeds. Um, what you see here, it's part of, um, you know, it's a, uh, uh, you know, structure with a, uh, with a very uh, discreet uh, shape. But then after substorms, they, the auroras get very, very diffuse. So what you get is like, um, like an overcast sky, but then you see that it's actually, it's not clouds, it's just auroras that are faint. And then you can see embedded in that diffuse light, you see patches and you see also a rays of light. Uh, during that time, it's when you can see the pulsating aurora. Um, the period of the pulsations are from like two to 10 seconds. I haven't seen them with the naked eye. I have seen them only in my time-lapse sequences. I'll play this again. 
but I did see them in real time looking, have this camera that by, co you know, by coincidence, it's called uh, Aurora. It's by a company called Psionics. Um, it's not necessarily made to see the Northern Lights. It's made to see at night. It's a, it's a night camera. So this footage that I'm showing is what I can capture with this, uh, with this camera. It's a very, very compact camera. And so I have seen the pulsating aurora only through, through this camera in, in, uh, in real time, but not, not, with my, not with an naked eye, although uh, they, they can become visible. So um, substorms are parts of the, uh, of the night where the aurora gets um, extremely dynamic and changes uh, uh, form and shape continuously. And basically, they break from those very discrete uh, curtains into structures that it can rapidly uh, rotate. That it's basically when they say that the aurora is, is dancing. So here, you'll see some time-lapse sequences where the aurora is discrete. You see a curtain in the, uh, on the horizon. And then it basically goes through a substorm. And uh, it can cover the entire sky, at least from Yellowknife. Notice that there's no preference in terms of direction. They're covering the entire sky. And here we see another example uh, music by one of the uh, from one of the films. So you can see how they go. You can see how they go from very discreet to the substorm where it's moving rapidly, the brightness goes up and then it becomes diffuse. And usually that happens, you know, uh, twice uh, within a couple of hours. So they'll get diffused and then they will reorganize themselves. You'll see some structure and they'll, and then they'll go through a substorm again. Um, people ask, you know, are, do they look that, uh, that colorful? So unfortunately for the human eye, the human eye has evolved in such a way that at, when the light conditions are low, we see uh, the eyes are concentrated on seeing different levels of brightness and not different colors. They think that it's probably because the, we were, uh, basically the uh, humans wanted to protect themselves from, from predators. And we wanted to see is, you know, uh, shapes and, 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 uh, and, and predators at night, not necessarily uh, seeing the full spectrum of, of, of color. But when the light becomes, when the auras become much, much brighter, then you start picking up more color. And that's why we can see that lower magenta because it's so, so bright. So what I've done here is I've just taken a photograph and desaturated uh, just to show you that this is more or less what you see, muted colors, but then the camera can capture, you know, the, capture, the camera can capture uh, more, more color. So it's not that the camera, you know, that you're, you know, tricking the, the viewer. It's just that the, the camera can capture something that a human eye cannot. So it's basically a limitation of, of the human eye. So one of the reasons why I go to Yellowknife is because it's continental weather. It's away from, uh, you know, big oceans. Um, so the skies are fairly clear and dry. Uh, there are a lot of lakes, but, you know, uh, there's a big lake near Yellowknife. So that's why it's better sometimes to just drive away from that main body of water. Uh, to avoid, you know, humidity and 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 local cloud uh, cloud formation. Um, most of the uh, Northwest Territories is beneath the Aurora Oval, and as you can see in that photograph, I can capture northern lights in all uh, directions, and it's relatively flat. So some places are absolutely beautiful and they have tall mountains, but so for photography, you know, it offers something very very appealing, but they can also be obstructing your view. So I like Yellowknife because you know they have their their hills and and, uh, and and gorges and rivers and lakes. So photography wise it's a very interesting place since have without having mountains of you know high 
uh, altitude that might block the, uh, the, the view. And the population is only around 20,000 people. So you can drive 30, 40 minutes away from the city and, and get really, you know, get to enjoy really dark skies. As you can see here in uh, uh, aerial view taken with a drone in, in September. Yeah, that's the old part of town. Uh, there is a, a beautiful waterfalls from where, you know, you can actually go during the day and then see that the lights illuminating the waterfalls at night. And like I said, that's why I, that led me to uh, organize the, the tours and, uh, and extend basically the, the, the mission of communicating science. Because now here, what we're doing is communicating science through photography and through talks that people enjoy during the uh, during the uh, during the stay in uh, in in Yellowknife, um, we visit the uh, First Nation people, the Dene people, so they uh, visitors can learn not only about uh, the auroras but also cultural aspects of of Yellowknife. There are lectures about the science behind the Northern Lights, how to photograph them. Here we are inside a teepee in one of the uh, Dene uh, villages. Very uh, picturesque. We go on bike tours. I got it. So during the day, you know, we're learning about Yellowknife, and then of course at night we're enjoying the enjoying this view. Uh, many lakes, so it's beautiful to get the reflections, particularly for those interested in photography, to get the beautiful reflections of the light on the on the different lakes. And then something that I have been embracing more and more is photographing the lights from within the city. Uh, at first, because of the nature of the films, I didn't want any, you know, man-made objects, any, you know, uh, cities and structures. So I was photographing nature. But now more and more I'm finding places in Yellowknife where I can capture that juxtaposition of the lights within uh, an urban setting, so to speak. Although, as you can see, it's really, really remote. Um, and then one of the places that we visit is this village with uh, heated, heated uh, teepees. So you can wait inside uh, until the arrest come out, when it's cold out, and then head outside when the auroras are in full display. So what you're gonna see here, this is real-time video. You can see that lower magenta. So this is actually very close to what the human eye can see. Yes. <laughs> and I think that, you know, better than seeing them in isolation is when you see them with people around and you can hear the reaction of people uh, to the Northern Lights, it makes it, not only they can actually, if you're not looking up and you're looking down at your equipment, they, it's a cue, hey, look up. But it's also, it, it makes it even more enjoyable to see other people so excited about the, the displays. And then, so that's in September. And then I do the same thing in March. Uh, so of course the landscape is very, very different, but the experience is similar in, in terms of the many uh, people and uh, the different activities. So we get to go on, um, on uh, you know, do all these uh, winter, winter act activities. Uh, uh, that was a particular race, but we actually get to drive those and enjoy the, um, the, the snow castle that gets uh, constructed every, every year on the frozen lake. That's beautiful. Uh, Dr. Salgado, this is so wonderful. I just wanted to do a quick time check. We have about 10 yes. minutes left. Oh, that, that's you fine. Because have, here, uh, I, okay. I, think, I think that this is the, I think this might be the last one. Okay, great. So, cool. so this, is, this is on an ice road. So in Yellowknife in the winter, 
you know, they make ice roads. So to go from point A to point B, you don't have to go around the lake, but actually you can drive on the lake. So this is an ice road. Um, this is close to one of the, uh, one of the parks. This is also a nice road. So we get to enjoy the, the, the lights from places from which in September, of course, we cannot enjoy them. This is one of the ice roads with a flash illuminating the, uh, the, uh, the exposed ice. And here you have some you know, URLs where you can learn more about the organization and, uh, and a portal that takes you to my photography and, and towards et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you so much. Thank you. This is absolutely phenomenal. And we are just so grateful for your coming today. Um, I know we did have a couple of questions. Um, I think Justin was wondering more about your Psionix Aurora camera. Yes. So let's see, uh, what can I tell you? Uh, I can tell you that just Google, you know, Psionix, um, S-I-O-N-Y-X. They have a newer model that has, I believe has a bigger sensor and, 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 and more sensitivity. So it's very, like I said, it's very, very neat. Not only, you don't need a tripod because you're taking video, right? So you can just point at the Aurora and capture what's going on. But like I said, I got the extra reward of seeing the Aurora pulsating and I couldn't see it with a naked eye, but I was able to see it in real time with this, with this camera. That's really cool. Uh, Liz has told me that she has a burning question to ask. I have a burning question. And I also want to see if anybody else has a burning question that they haven't asked yet. So maybe just raise your hand if you have a question as well. So I'm wondering, um, it's so, it, as you said, easy to get attention with the beautiful photos, but it is also very hard to describe the Aurora in some ways. Um, and I was just wondering if you've kind of um, learned more about that in terms of questions people have from either the, the people who come to the symphony and hear your lecture and ask questions or from the photographers um, who are out on the tour. I was just wondering if you, you know, just a, that's my burning question. If, if they have learned, if I have learned new things just by, by listening to their questions. Yeah, which group, which group do you learn more from kind of? Um, that makes sense. Let's see, I would say judging from, you know, from experience and I have had only one major uh, group of, you know, of photographers, everybody else is, is just, you know, one, uh, it's, it's a blend between uh, photographers and non-photographers because I don't discourage people who are not into photography not to, uh, to join the tour. But I would say um, it's, Usually, you know, the general public uh, in lectures maybe leading to the uh, leading to the concerts um, that I get. I guess those those interested in in photography might have been exposed so, so one way or another to the Northern Lights because it's so popular nowadays. But I guess that those that are not into photography, maybe you catch them more. Uh, you know, by surprise, and they uh, perhaps are a little bit more in awe of of this phenomenon. Maybe they have have heard less about the Northern Lights. So maybe from general public that are not necessarily into in into photography, and you know, the questions are very um, you know very very similar. People want to know. Uh, okay, so this is what you. Can capture with a with a with a camera, but what is it that you can capture, but that you can view directly with your eye, you know? And that's why it's for me. It's, for me, that's why I'm more interested now in real time video, because I can tell them this is how fast they can move. For example, right before I would show time lapse photography of substorms, and I would tell them this is sped up. They're really fast, but this is sped up. Okay, so how much is it? How much is, is it's actually sped up, or how fast do they actually move? And now, to me, that's the this is the that's a brave new world. Is okay. I have so many time lapse sequences. What I want to do is maximize my equipment in terms of light gathering, in terms of sensor, so I can 
capture as close as possible what I'm witness, right? Under the lights. And yeah. that, and, and so th to me, that, that's, a, that's what it, what's exciting about video these days. That would also be amazing to hear with original music as well. Um, I still definitely want to get you here to my hometown for that also. Right, ab absolutely. And then in the future, you know, okay, so I have three films. They, they, you know, they basically rely on time-lapse photography. At some point, I would say maybe in a couple of years, it would be great to have another piece, maybe, you know, just a few minutes long, but that relies on real-time video. Again, so people can, so, so you, you take people closer to what they can actually experience. Any other questions? Anybody want to jump in? Do you have any kind of favorite um, new equipment or trick or anything like that that you might want to? I mean, I think we can see in your in your slides how beautiful they are and and um, it, really inspiring. So. so thank you. So the good thing is cameras in general are so good that anyone with a DSLR or a mirrorless, you know, a camera can uh, capture the, 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 the beauty of the Northern Lights. Hey, even, even smartphones, you know, if the auroras are really, really bright and you have your smartphone on a tripod and you have an app that lets you take a long exposure, right, an exposure of a few seconds, uh, you can get incredible photographs of the, of the Northern Lights. And actually, I've seen side-by-side -side photographs taken by, with smartphones and, and DSLRs, and they're very, very decent. Of course, it's just that that will work when the aurora is extremely bright. And if they're not, that's when you, of course, you need uh, uh, higher-end equipment. But nowadays, anybody with a good DSLR or you know, modern DSLR or mirrorless can take very, uh, very good photographs. The challenge, like I said, is because on video, you're taking shorter and shorter exposures, right? Instead of taking a three second, ex three second exposure, now you're taking an exposure that it's like 1 30th of a second, 1 24th of a second, right? So now it's the other way around. It's a fraction of a second per exposure. You need the best equipment that you can afford and the fastest possible lens. That is a lens with a small, you know, F ratio, F number, and and of course that equipment, you know, starts to become more and more expensive. But you know, I can only imagine what cameras and and and, and faster lenses will do in a couple of years in terms of in terms of video. For me, that's the you know that's that's a new frontier. Well, thank you so much. We have one last quick question that is going to segue into something that that we want to just sort of put out there real quick. What is on your T-shirt? Oh, it's a, so it's a you know it's a combination of two things that I like, right? I like I love music and I love uh, I love rock, and so I we have a, an astronaut playing a, an electric guitar in space. I love it. Well, thank you so much. I am going to turn the recording off and then we have one quick announcement and we're just going to say thank you so, so much, Dr. Salgado, for coming and sharing with us. Um, I will be putting this on YouTube probably tomorrow, uh, so we will have that up to watch later so everybody can share it with your friends. Thank you again. Thank you.